Hi there, and welcome to the 38th episode of Octoprint on Air. I'm your host, Gina Hoske, and this one, this episode is a bit unusual because, uh, yeah, contrary to what I usually do, this one isn't live streamed, but I'm actually pre-recording it. The reason is simply that I'm currently, yeah, my, my Fridays are a bit booked through at, at, at the moment. And uh, yeah, I also have a lot of other stuff going on in my private life and all that. So it's a bit tricky right now to find good appointments to live stream these things on Fridays, on Friday afternoons, my time or early evenings. So I figured I would just do what I already did in the past once and just pre-record it during my regular office hours and... So this is what I'm doing today. Yeah, so uh, uh, we will pretty much do the same thing still that we always do. Uh, so the short outline of the contents of this here is, uh, first of all, I will tell you what I've been up to since the last installment of uh, Auto Print on Air. Then I'll tell you what the next steps will be. So what I plan on working on. Uh, then we'll have a quick look at the stats and then usually we would have a short Q&A segment. The only problem is there were no questions left in the backlog. There is obviously this being a recorded session, not a live chat right now that I can rely on either. So we'll just have to skip the Q&A, sadly. If you are a patron at the $5 or above level or GitHub sponsor and you want to ask questions, hand in questions for these Q&A segments, then please keep an eye on your email inbox because I always paste um, the link for the collection form when a new appointment for a, for an uh, Octoprint on Air broadcast is scheduled and uh, also when it's just a recording. Uh, so yeah, sadly nothing arrived, so no Q&A. But yeah, I, I'll just take it that you are completely in the clear on everything Octoprint related and I can't teach you anything anymore maybe. Okay, so what I've been up to. Uh, first of all, the majority of my work uh, the past couple of weeks has been going towards 1.60 or rather what is going to be 1.60. Um, so I worked on a ton of bug fixes and small improvements and such. Um, for example, you can now bulk download log files just like I already introduced it and I think I mentioned it in the last one for uh, time lapses based on a PR that reached me. Um, I put in some workarounds uh, to to uh, compensate for issues with older browsers. For example, we had an issue in the tracker of someone trying to run Octoprint on an, on, an, on a really old iPad. I think it was an iPad 2 or something. And the Safari included in this was simply no longer up to, yeah, the more modern JavaScript that sometimes makes its way into Octoprint plugins. So um, what I did now is, first of all, I made absolutely sure that none of these uh, yeah, non-ES5 compatible parts of, of JavaScript, so ES6, like let const variables and all that and arrow functions, made it into the core. Uh, I actually found some culprits there. And I also added an, uh, a polyfill so that whatever can be patched for older browsers will be patched for older browsers. Uh, this is more to work for uh, or, or work towards uh, plugin uh, support. And uh, I also added an ESLIN step to the whole Octoprint code check uh, workflow to make sure that uh, the Octoprint core, it, core code itself stays ES5 compatible. So we do not have something like const or arrow functions or something make its way back into the code. That is about the only thing I can do right now. Um, and yeah, I hope it will help. Uh, long term, we will probably, however, be looking at, uh, I mean, I've, I've hinted at this before, so Octoprint's UI is still based on Bootstrap 2, and um, which hasn't been supported for a while now. It's making use of a quiet, yeah, let's say not, not very well-known JavaScript framework called Knockout.js, which uh, apparently confuses a lot of people, and so is also not very much suited to get people to work with and um yeah so the current idea is that long term or rather yeah I, i'm not sure if i would make it for 2.0 but long term i i want to create a new ui uh, i currently am still in the evaluation phase or re with regards to what framework to choose though i'm very 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 much looking towards react right now after having built the bundle viewer in it and also now my relaunch block and all that and um yeah but 
when it comes to that, I will see that with transpiling and all that, we can make it as compatible as possible, but it will also not make it a focus to support uh, yeah, iPads from 2014. I hope you all understand that. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll see where that ends up with. But for now, at least, I, I hope the most pressing issues should be fixed so that you can actually use ancient devices as something like a dashboard, a mounted dashboard next to your printer or something. All right. Um, additionally, there was some issue that uh, was discovered around the same time where, yeah, if you have some JavaScript library that is already minified and you uh, pushed it through Octoprint's minifier again, sometimes stuff was produced that broke. So this is not happening anymore. Octoprint will now detect that. Um, then uh, something that was annoying a ton of people, myself included, by the way, uh, and which is a bit of a pain point now also with Octopi 0.18, is that Octoprint so far refuses to, um, um, or rather the backup plug in the bundled one in Octoprint, so far refused to restore from backups that were created with a newer, newer Octoprint version than uh, the one currently running. And that included the full version. So if you create a backup, let's say under 153, and you now flash Octopi 018, which which comes by default with, I think 152 or 151, I'm not entirely sure, but something smaller, then uh, Octoprint will tell you, no, you cannot restore this plugin. You first have to update to a newer version and then you can restore the plugin, which of course just is annoying, especially when we're talking about so-called patch versions. So in the case of 151, 152, 153, the 123 are the so-called patch versions. So they usually indicate that um, yeah, only small stuff has changed, only, only minor bug fixes or something and nothing that should actually have any influence on how a backup restore works. So the decision has been made and starting with 1.6 that will also be implemented, um, that Octoprint will allow you to restore backups from the same major minor version, uh, regardless of which patch level, but not um, something that is newer than that. So for example, if you now create, um, if you now have if we now have 1.6 uh, released and you now have, for example, uh, 1.6.0 and you create a backup, uh, sorry, bad example, 1.6.1 and you create a backup on that. And then you, for some reason, you install 1.6.0 somewhere and you want to apply the backup. That will now work. Um, that didn't work before because 1.6.1 is newer than 1.6.0, but it will now work. Um, if, however, you now create a backup on some day the release version of 170 or 171 or something and try to apply that to an uh, Octoprint 1.6, then Octoprint will still refuse to do that because it's not just a difference in the minor uh, in the patch version, but actually in the minor version. And the same, of course, if you create a backup under Octoprint 2.0, whenever it will be released and try to apply that to anything under one, that will also not work. So the idea here really is to allow uh, some kind of flexibility with regards to what plugins are created at which point and all that, and th th that you can still apply them to at least the same major minor version. Sorry, there's a very, very loud airplane out there. I hope you do not hear that. <laughs> um, uh, where was I? Right. Um, so that you can still apply that to the same major minor version, uh, regardless of the patch level. But yeah, we still, I still want to keep this fallback in place that, or not fallback, but the safety, uh, um, the safety basically that makes it so that you cannot apply something from a newer version of Octoprint, a completely newer version. So a different major, different minor, uh, or different minor or different major. So in this order, uh, to an, to an older version. The, the reason is simple that I, I, I cannot anticipate this, but there might be reasons for me to have to change the backup format or to have to change some processing steps on how to restore a backup, for example, that would be incompatible to an earlier version. And I cannot uh, yeah, retroactively work around this in older versions, obviously. So um, the, the, the idea here is that by only allowing to apply backups from older versions or at least the same major minor versions, we make sure or I make sure 
that I can I, I do not run into any kind of yeah backwards incompatible issues with backups from future versions that are being tried to be applied to current versions or even older versions and wreak havoc on the file system or anything like that. So this is more like a, a precaution than anything else really. Yeah. But now it's a bit less restrictive and I hope some of you or many of you will be happy about that. Um, then we also had a bit of, an, of, of a problem or already discovered one or it was reported I think on the community forums or something. I, I can't remember. I think it was a plugin author that, that noticed it. But um, yeah, some recent versions of was it Marlin or was it some other firmware? Anyhow, um, reported also some, some date string with a timestamp in the firmware information. So in the response to M115. And Octoprince Parser couldn't handle that because so far Octoprince Parser assumed that anything that has the structure of key uh, colon value is like this key colon value pair, a uh, key value pair, and something like 10 colon 03 colon 30, which is like 10 30, uh, 10, 10, um, 10, uh, 10, 3 and 30 seconds or something. Yeah, that sadly was also parsed and produced some hilarious firmware information um, data structures. But this has now been fixed. Uh, thanks to Charlie for the initial PR and then we collaborated on it a bit more and um, made it so that it should hopefully no longer cause any kind of issues in that regard. Um, yeah, additionally, I also did some hardening on the API, some, some caching fixes, some uh, stuff like this. So, uh, yeah, uh, I could probably talk for hours about all the small things that I did on the code base that will go into 160 and I would bore you to death with that because individually all that stuff isn't really that interesting probably, but uh, yeah, everything together will, I think, be a very nice release and uh, mean a lot of improvements of tiny annoyances and uh, bugs and all that that have been, uh, yeah, that have been troubling people for a while now. Yeah, so that was 1.6. But I did not only work on 1.6 this time, which is awesome because I finally also found time to work on 2.0 again. Um, so first of all, what I had to do, and this is something that I absolutely dreaded for a long time, was I had to, um, uh, I had to uh, move the whole com refactoring branch over to Python 3 because that was still on Python 2. Uh, because the last time that I actually had a chance to work on it was still when Devil was only on Python 2 or, only, or, or with only some Python 3 migration done. So that was what a lot of, was a lot of fun, not? And um, once I, I did that and then I also had to do a ton of refactoring and, and all that, but now everything is fine again. Thankfully, the time that I invested in uh, some tooling um, to do this migration stuff again and again and again whenever we merge from maintenance to Devil, um, because maintenance is still Python 2 and 3 compatible and devil is Python 3 only. Uh, yeah, paid off because I could just throw my tooling against the code base and it rewrote everything and now things are great. Uh, yeah, so that was that. And uh, then I wrapped my head around the, the to-dos I still had, started categori categorizing them, cataloging them and got to work. So I did a lot of fiddling um working on stuff that was still missing um tried to make it feature uh, parity uh, 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 yeah improve feature parity with the current com layer and all that so there's still some stuff missing and this is probably going to be the 20 percent that take the 80 percent of the time um like probably not that bad but you get my drift but uh, yeah we are really getting there and i thought maybe it would be interesting to see for you where we are at, um, even though right now I can only offer you a connection against the virtual printer because I do not have anything connected to my PC here. But um, yeah, so uh, let me just quickly switch you over. By the way, this is a picture that I took myself and I'm extremely proud of. Um, t let me take you quickly here. So this is uh, Octoprint in, uh, in the in the com refactoring and G branch currently running locally and you see that the connection thing here has changed significantly and I think I already showed this in an Octoprint on air like maybe uh, over a year ago but I figured it would maybe be interesting again to see it because most of you have probably have either already forgotten or never seen it before. So this first of all looks very 
small like there is not much there right but uh, you can adjust the connection parameters so this is a bunch of connection profiles connection profiles are a bit more encompassing than printer profiles printer profile only def defines like stuff like the access uh, speed and the, the the volume of the of the print uh, the print volume basically the boundaries of the print volume uh, extrude account stuff like this and connection profiles now tie a printer profile with a pro together with a protocol and a transport what is a protocol and a transport let me show you for example uh, if I say I I'm, I'm now looking at the connection profiles virtual yeah, right but yeah, apparently I did not really save it with whatever so we have one printer profile here and it's just default we have a protocol protocol is currently only the rep rep g code fl uh, protocol which is available with a flavor and here is where all these you, you might remember that I rented a bit here and there about the uh, very fragmented landscape that is 3d printer firmware because even if a printer talks this g-code protocol stuff it doesn't necessarily talk it the same way, way as another printer and this is where these flavors come in so we have a bunch of, of slightly different interpretations here and this is pretty much just labeled version of all these various checkboxes that so far you had in your serial connection tab where you uh, uh, not serial connection tabs or in the serial connection settings where you could change firmware behavior where you could uh, change stuff like error handling and all that and all of this is now mirrored in um, or modeled rather in these flavors and um, this also includes stuff like which command does what and such and um, a protocol gets spoken over a transport and here we have serial connection serial URL connection so instead of specifying a port and a baud rate like you're used to from now you can also define it via um, a special URL scheme that PySeries supports so I figured I could just throw that in there as well TCP connection so you have a host here a host name and a port and this is a network connection so same rep rep code uh, rep rep g code protocol talked over a tcp connection or over a serial connection over tcp the only difference here is that this one will require line numbs uh, will not require line numbs and checksums because tcp should really already have um, everything built in and this one here assumes that it is pretty much just talking the old the regular protocol is or, or rather it's just the same as a regular serial connection so with all the connection loss that might potentially happen and all that but over tcp so yeah these are details that are not that necessary to know right now but i just thought it would be interesting to see that there are currently already four transport versions that would work in theory if there was a printer that supported them in the background so what is confusing me right now, to be honest, is that the virtual connection is missing here. Which makes showing you stuff a bit tricky because I was actually, I wanted to connect to the virtual printer. So it looks like I broke something. Or was that here? No. Hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll have to debug that apparently. So I will not be able to connect to the virtual printer now, but I can still show you. Um, so all the stuff that you are used to still maybe from the serial connection um, settings dialog now lives in the protocol parameters of an of a of a uh, of a protocol uh, attached to a connection profile so all of this stuff like send a checksum with the command and all that is still defined over the flavor but you can override it as well so you, you can basically define your own flavors as well if needed and yeah you already know the cancelling the pausing the error handling and all that so this is just the same thing moved into a different location and a bit more um, flexible with regards to combining it and also uh, configuring it differently depending on which printer you have there so it makes it easier if you have one octoprint instances instance but maybe four printers and you connect it to not not at the same time but you connect it to each of them regularly then you can now just define a connection profile for them all of them and everything will just be right so you just connect uh, select a connection profile and click connect and everything else will just fall in place 
that's the idea here. And uh, the rest is just as usual. So if I now click connect here and I, and the virtual printer was actually here, which it isn't, then I uh, could, uh, you would just get the usual stuff here in terminal. You could send commands, you could receive commands, uh, printing works. Um, the, the percentage is also, the, the recent percentage, the recent ratio is also already implemented. That was something I introduced in 150, I think. And uh, yeah, it took a bit to get it to work here, but I got it to work there. And yeah, so what is the status of this thing or of this whole re-implementation? You see a lot of the stuff already works. Um, some things are still missing. So minor stuff, I still have to, for example, get auto connect to work during server startup. Um, and uh, also serial auto detection is also something that currently doesn't work yet. But so this would do nothing. Um, on the other hand, what you might see here is uh, there is now way more information uh, available for the individual um, uh, COM ports that are detected in your system. So I hope that long term people will not have to depend on auto detect anymore that much either because they can hopefully just see what this is. And yeah. Um, and uh, connection profiles are also here available here. But right now, this is also something that I still want to implement, but haven't yet is uh, an editor so that you can all that that you can do in the connection dialog uh, on the on the sidebar. Uh, so everything that you can configure here should also be configurable here. Uh, so an edit button is missing and it needs to be wired up. That is pretty much it. And also, yeah, it should probably also be possible to add one here. And this is also not possible right now. So um, uh, the, the general to do list is or the things that I actually already found. Let me quickly just change uh, share that with you. Um, so the, the firmware information that I mentioned earlier with M115 and all that, that is currently not fully being propagated yet through the whole system. I have to figure out why that is. The auto connect on startup I already mentioned. I also hope to be able to not tie the auto connect on start necessarily to a COM port anymore, like we are used to now from Octoprint, but that it can do something like if the same vendor ID and product ID, uh, USB vendor and a product ID shows up in the system, it will know this is the printer regardless on which port the, the underlying operating system put it because this has been a request. Um, I'm not sure though if I can put it off because that is very serial connection specific and the whole system is more non-specific, so to say. Um, safe and connect is currently also not working. so or rather the safe on connect. Uh, currently, when you have connected through something and disconnect, then it will reset to the currently connection profile instead of um, instead of uh, showing you what you used to connect to. This is also something I need to fi fix. Um, then I also had, yeah, I added some, some way to refresh the port list and the baud rate list and all that is dynamic and working in the back end already, but in the front end, it is not yet mirrored. So that needs to change. Um, I added, uh, I need to edit the UI for the connection profiles. I already mentioned that and also for the transport protocol settings. So actually this one I think is done, but this one is missing. It was this way around, right? Um, serial transport auto detection. I already mentioned that. And the wrapper protocol, so the implementation of the G code that is spoken to printers might also still need some ironing out here and there. But so far, I didn't find anything specific, which is why there is nothing behind this. Or rather, I, I fixed everything that I had already found. So the current idea is that I just keep on working on this and try to uh, make it feature pair. Uh, achieve feature, make it feature parity. I don't know how to say that, but achieve feature parity with what is currently in Octoprint. Though I will strip some stuff. I already said that a while ago that so things like, uh, I think no one even knows of, about the existence of pause triggers. So I'm simply going to remove them because they, what they were meant to do is achievable through other means now. And there is really no need to implement stuff that almost no one probably even knows about. So this is going to go the way of the dodo, but yeah. Okay. So that was that. 
Um, I'm going to quickly move you back to me now because I'm going to talk a bit more about stuff that I've been up to. Um, so uh, only a recent change really. Um, if you've ever tried to register a plugin on the Octoprint plugin web repository and forgot to mark it as Python 3 compatible, you might have gotten someone comment on your pull request. So either Jim or Charlie or, uh, or Ollie, uh, hey, we only accept Python 3 compatible plugins now. You forgot something here. And instead of having them always have to do that and you not getting immediate feedback from the already in place plugin uh, validation check thingy that we have on the plugin repository, that will now also detect that and mark uh, the, the check as failing and tell you about this, hopefully. So that is something that I only implemented, I think, yesterday or so. And um, yeah. Then stuff that doesn't necessarily have directly to do something with Octoprint, but that certainly uh, had an, in, uh, an impact on Octoprint the one way or the other. Sorry, my throat is fighting a bit. I'm with, the, with lots of talking and no drink. Um, water, by the way, just for the record. Um, yeah, so just when I wanted to test all this work that I had done on the new COM layer, the... Uh, one of my printers decided to go with a clog of doom. So I had a lot of fun with that uh, because the others also at that point weren't in a, in a, in a position that I could uh, actually use them for debugging. So yeah, that then was me spending like a whole Friday completely disassembling everything, trying to somehow remove the clog in the heat break of the hot end that for some reason had developed there. I don't know how, I don't know where. I cut myself in the process. So that is probably the reason why everything is running now again, because usually when I sacrifice blood during something like hardware work, then stuff works again. Um, at least it's been like that for every PC that I've ever built. And um, yeah, so I took the opportunity and also pretty much rebuilt everything and uh, replaced the extruder, replaced the hot end and uh, and stuff and then I of course had to calibrate it again and I'm not completely done with this yet but yeah I mean you all know how this goes I guess I'm not the first one to encounter a clock of doom but in this case it put a bit of a of a wrench into my plans of working on the com layer during that specific Friday and yeah but hey I did it the only downside of it was also and that was the next problem uh, yeah, spending a whole day bending over a partially disassembled printer and exchanging parts and trying to uh, figure out how to attach new things to it that so far had never been attached to it before. Not good for my back, so intense back pain for a couple of days, which led to me having to reactivate my standing desk. And I'm actually, I've actually been talking to you all this time already now standing at said standing desk. Um, and uh, yeah, I figured I really need to use it more often and I figured I really need to find a way to use it more often. And that was the point where I decided, hey, maybe I should just build in, finally build in the, the drop in uh, replacement controller that I bought on Tindy a couple of uh, months ago, which is called a mega desk, which is like a replacement controller for IKEA bekannt desks standing desks, electronic standing desks. And that thing is absolutely amazing. <laughs> I just I just had to somehow pry the encasing of the controller unit open, drop in the board or rather replace it with replace the existing board with that one. And now I have uh, a, a height uh, a memory and all that. And that is really nice because now I'm actually using the standing desk again more because I don't have to keep my finger on the button in order for it to go up and down, but I just click it a couple of times to select the correct height and it will do the rest. So this is awesome. Uh, yeah, if you're interested in my general workplace uh, setup, uh, yeah, I already mentioned that I did, I, I relaunched my, my my personal website in React also to get, or rather in Next.js and therefore also in React to uh, wrap my head around this framework, get, get it to know a bit better, make a better informed choice or a decision on whether to use it for the next Octoprint UI or not. And yeah, well, I also wrote a blog, blog post about my workplace in the, in, the, in the process. So if you are interested in that kind of stuff, take a look, maybe at fusel.net. Um, 
but yeah that is all i'm going to say on that because this is actually m more like my uh, free time uh, stuff but i still wanted to drop it here because it might actually help some of you as well if you suffer from similar issues okay um and something that was not actually my doing but it's still something that I want to share here. You might remember the bundle viewer that I showed you last time. Also, somehow the light is getting a bit darker here. Sorry for that. The, the whole weather outside is just ex exceedingly stupid these days. Um, let me quickly just show you this in the hope to jog your memory. Uh, we need that button. Uh, so the bundleviewer.octoprint.org is something that I wrote for system information bundles that are going to be a part of Octoprint 1.6. I mentioned that, that is basically just going to be a zip file and contains all the, uh, so the Octoprint log, the serial log, and uh, some information about the system and all that. And this can then be displayed there. Uh, let me actually check if I maybe have, do I have some? Yeah, we'll just try that one maybe. Perfect. So um, this is an example uh, that uh, an example system info bundle that I um, just uh, extracted from 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 a, from an Octoprint maintenance build, and uh, so it, it will just show you a lot of information about the system that usually is hard to come by when you try to retrieve it from people or, or try people to try to get people to actually tell you about that, and um, yeah, now all of this is here. I can access the Octoprint log. I can read, uh, I can search in the Octoprint log. I also get some syntax highlighting here for the log levels and all that. I can get an immediate uh, warning that the serial log is disabled here. So I can tell the user, hey, you forgot something without having to actually look. I, I just have to take note of the, of the icon. And I also get the plugin software update console log and the manager uh, plugin manager console log because when people have issues installing plugins, this is also what I usually need to help them. So all of this is now contained in one zip file and can be displayed here. And uh, Charlie, uh, so CP two thousand four, uh, or, or took it on him to write a a, sim a single a, a small. Uh, a small browser extension that just adds an uh, open and bundle viewer link to uh, stuff that you right click on Octo on the Octoprint forums or on, on the Octoprint uh, GitHub issue tracker and all that. So that is really nice because um, the I also changed the bundle viewer to not only accept the zip files, but you can also use it to open individual log files. And combined with that, we now have a really nice log viewer that is tailored towards Octoprint that we can immediately use already now. On the forums and on on the issue tracker and all that and once 160 is out i will also make system info bundles mandatory in in issues and then that will all be absolutely amazing but yeah so big kudos to charlie works in every major uh, browser uh, absolutely love it already have used it a ton so really awesome stuff right um what are the next steps actually let me move this back here uh, so, yeah, I want to release 160 as, as soon as possible. Uh, I still need to implement some minor improvements that are scheduled or, or yeah, that I added to the milestone uh, a while ago already. Um, but uh, apart from that, the, the release should hopefully soon be really ready and or pretty much is already. Um, and the goal is for me to, uh, yeah, I want to release a first RC416 uh, by the end of March. And um, then the stable release as soon as possible after that. As usual, we will probably have something like one to two, maybe more release candidates. This all depends on the feedback that I get and uh, the experience of people with things and, and also... Uh, yeah, and, and also just pure luck sometimes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, and uh, the whole release will probably be very bug fix and improvement heavy, as I already hinted at. Uh, there is not much new functionality that I put in there, but a lot of improvements and fixes of annoyances and all that. And uh, yeah, uh, after that, or rather next to that also, the I obviously also want to continue to work on 2.0. So now that I all finally have gotten back on it, um, 
I already, and I forgot to mention that earlier, but I already also did, um, I, re I mentioned last time that there were still some Py2 leftovers, Python 2 leftovers in there that I wanted to get rid of. And I got this now and I also automated that thanks to a nifty little tool that I learned about called Py Updater. Py Update, Py Updater. I'm, I'm confused now again. I think it was Py Update, not Py Updater. Let me quickly take a look. Sorry, it was Pi Update. Or? No, it was not Pi Update. It was actually Pi Upgrade. Ah, oh, Pi Upgrade. No, we have it. Okay, sorry, Pi Upgrade, uh, which pretty much does a lot of the things that I earlier implemented with code mods that I implemented myself. Things like changing certain code constructs from Python 2 to Python 3 format or from Python 2 to Python 2 and 3 format. And um, I now use that plus some code mods that I also implemented because it's Pi update, uh, Pi upgrade <laughs> could not do that um, uh, yet. And um, yeah, that, that sped up things a ton. And uh, yeah, as I said, that being said, so regular Python 2.0 stuff, but also the com refactoring branch, because the goal is to merge this into 2.0 as soon as possible. And for that, I only need to take care of the to do's that you saw there. And hopefully I will not stumble over many more. Uh, all in all, I got to say, I felt very, very good finally being able to get back on this and work on this. Um, especially given the current situation here in Germany with regards to the pandemic, which is uh, yeah, very distracting, but I still managed to make some progress there again and, and good progress actually. And that that was something that was well overdue and uh, helped me a ton to feel better. Um, yeah, uh, regarding 2.0, there's also something else that I'm not sure yet when I will get around to do it. Um, it's probably after I, or, or when I will get around to do it for good, um, but I might, try to at least implement a small um, prototype because yeah I recently learned a lot about the new async IO HTTP frameworks that are available on on Python 3 and they would help a lot with issues that we had or still have with Octoprint due to its architecture because right now Octoprint is or Octoprint's um, yeah web server part is implemented with Tornado and Tornado gen has Flask uh, hooked into itself through a, a WSGI bridge. And that is really not the best idea. And if I had known more about the um, about the, the, the both of these technologies and how they interact with each other and about the WSGI standard and all that, then I would not have chosen this route uh, because the problem is that Tornado is a single threaded web server and Flask in theory could also work with something like this, but Embedding Flask via a WSGI um, bridge into Tornado makes it so that if you have a long running request in Flask, it will block the whole Tornado server because WSGI is defined as synchronous only. So yeah, that was not the best choice, but live and learn. So long term, I want to get rid of that. And the idea that I sketched out when, uh, one night when I couldn't, re uh, couldn't sleep, <laughs> um, is that, uh, uh, yeah, I want to see that I can implement or rather that I can turn the, the embedded web server into something primarily into, into some async IO uh, framework. So I'm, I'm currently looking at Starlet and Fast, Fast API, but implement also keep a Tornado, Tornado integrated as well, listening, in, listening on a different port and falling back to it through a reverse proxy um, so that I, yeah, so that, that all the plugins right now out there that depend on Flask and Tornado still can work. Um, but we have a, a, a more performant uh, API integration going forward. So this is something that I would love to just spend something like a day or so investigating and experimenting if the idea that I have on how to pull this off will actually work. And that is something that I hope to get around to during the next weeks as well. Um, yeah, and then there's also one problem that I uh, got to admit, I still don't have a good idea on how to solve, but it's something that I really need to solve and soon. 
we currently have a bit of an issue in the plugin repository or in the plugin world in general in Octoprint with regards to um, case sensitiveness of plugin ideas. So currently um, users are, or authors, plugin authors are using uppercase, lowercase, mixed case, whatever ideas um, for their plugins, which in theory is not that bit of a, big of a problem. The problem is that they are handled differently between the plugin repository, the usage tracking and uh, Octoprint itself. So I'm actually not entirely sure right now if they are lowercase in Octoprint or not, but we certainly observed some issues with usage tracking data exported from the tracking system for specific plugins because some of them with this case sensitivity issue, they uh, yeah, simply do not see any data exported. And that is something that I need to look into and also ideally want to solve globally. So yeah, I gotta say that is another one of these cases where you can say hindsight is 2020 because uh, I, for some reason, I never anticipated that people would use mixed case or uppercase for the plugin IDs and just assumed any everyone just like me would use lowercase. But yeah, so I should just have enforced lowercase, then we would not be in this mess now, but I'll figure it out, I guess. Speaking of stats, um, we can actually move over to the stats view now, uh, when I find the button to press, which, which should be that one. So uh, actually let me switch to this because then you can actually see everything. So um, we have the usual here, the number of seen instances over seven of the past seven days keeps climbing and climbing and climbing. And this is only from the people who have opted their instances into the usage tracking. So that is quite a number of people. Um, yeah, we have not seen that much of version uh, 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 fragmentation here because, I mean, there were, were no, no, no updates or anything like that. Um, the, the fun thing here really is that the Python version uh, now sees that we are already at one third of all instances that get tracked are now at, Octo uh, are now at Python 3 and that is really, really good news. I hope that well, maybe not the next time, but soon we will look at this and it will be a two thirds. That would be really nice. And you also see how it climbed over the past 60 days. So we went from 60 days ago, we were still at uh, only 7.6 K Python 3 instances versus 45 K of Python 2 instances. And now we are at 18.1 versus 39.2. So there definitely were some conversions there. And uh, and and almost a tripling so uh, of the Python 3 instances. So that is really, really good news. And uh, definitely the right direction. Yeah. Uh, print durations or printed hours per version are the usual. Um, there's not much to see really. So I just wanted to give you a quick overview because I always give you a big, big quick overview, but frankly, this time it's not, there's not much to see there. Um, just a quick reminder uh, for, a, yeah, ever since the start of the year or actually ever since Christmas or something, we've now had uh, data.octoprint.org live where you get an, 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 an export of some of this data. So you can actually take a look at it yourself. And uh, so unique instances per hour and uh, for 30 days and for seven days. So you see how stuff is climbing. Um, the Octoprint version distribution, 30 days, seven days. The same for the Python version and, uh, and the split of Python 2 versus 3. So this is all that is currently here. But we also have this folder where um, there is also a bunch of raw data that, which is actually being used by the the other, uh, the, the data.octoprint.org graphs, um, and uh, I think uh, I'm not sure if it was Charlie or Jim or Ollie, but someone wrote uh, some tooling so that you can actually use this data to dis if you're a plugin author to display stats for your plugin on the uh, on your on on a static website as well. So. Maybe if you're interested into stuff like that, you can also take a look at this. Uh, if you look into this, you just get a lot of information about all the instances. And this is basically the, the graph by date and all that. So yeah, uh, these, uh, these things get exported every hour 
from the tracking server and uh, then pushed over here. Uh, so feel free to look at this data, play with it. And I also hope, or I will also look into more exports if they are needed. Um, yeah, so that was that. Back to me. Um, yeah, and usually I would now go over to the Q&A segment, but as I already said, there is none this time because we do not have any questions in the backlog left. Um, so just let me instead wrap this up. Um, yeah, I'm not entirely sure yet, yet if I will make the next one of these again a broadcast as usual or if it will be another recording. I'll just have to see how my schedule works. And um, I hope this is also something that works for you as in, I know we did not have this the usual kind of interaction with the chat now that we have and all that but i think if you just want to get an update on what i'm working on and maybe get some chance to look at new stuff as it's being developed and all that that should hopefully be a good solution or a good compromise let's say uh when my schedule is simply not um complying with um friday evening live streams yeah so uh with that being said uh let me just finish this with uh, thanks for being here. I hope it was interesting for you. And uh, as always, of course, stay healthy and happy printing. Bye.